Hello, everyone. And I will start with a question, actually. Why doesn't it, why does, uh, doesn't it work? OK. Yeah. <laughs> so uh, we all keep hearing about this containers, Docker, images, think, you know, it's all great. It's all cloud scale. It's all microservices. But um, there is this, I mean, I think you know, so many people forget to, to ask actually a pretty important question. Why do we even bother about it? I, we know that everyone talks about it, but why? So my name is Michal, this is Ken, and this is Sergey. We are all Team Cola, and we'll start by, we'll try to answer this question for you. So first of all, deployment with containers is quite a reliable thing. So I don't know if you ever use containers, but uh, deploying with them is uh, pretty much consists of two distinct steps. One is building the containers, the other one is deploying them. And what's nice about building containers, it's not only call the packages, installing all the, uh, installing all the things in the operating system, and that's the most volatile part of any deployment, because this is, this is part when we actually depend on our uh, uplink, on our networking, on the other people's repositories, and with containers, we can do it before we, uh, before we even start deploying. We can make sure that we install everything and all the repositories were there during installation. What, also, what that also means that, for example, you deploy 100 nodes. And someone somewhere in some repository just happened to switch version of a particular package during your deployment. That will leave you in a quite strange situation when half of your nodes will have one version of package, half of the nodes will have another version of package, which is, which is bad, maybe bad. Uh, so if you pre-build your packages, you are pretty much guaranteed to have the uh, same exactly version on everything and every node, and the node will look exactly the way you want. And moreover, if you actually want to check which versions are there, you just check uh, which containers are running, and that's it. You have all the Ramba, all the information you need about your node in one single place. So that also means that if you pre-build your containers, and you, like any good uh, enterprise should have, you have your staging environment on which you will test out your environment, it will look exactly the same on production. Versions will be the same, setups will be the same, directories will be the same. That's really great for uh, production environments and staging. So uh, that also means that upgrades are awesome with the containers, so much easier. It's uh, because we, as I said, we can build containers before. We also can download these containers to the uh, nodes before we even touch the environment. We can prepare all the things Download all the packages, download the, uh, prepare them on the nodes themselves before we even touch anything that's running, any running environment. That's great. The, what's other, the other thing that's awesome about containers is uh, uh, every package has a dependencies. That's especially true if you're talking about OpenStack, if you've ever seen requirements.txt, there are probably over 100 lines there, which means uh, if you for example, run Nova and Neutron container in the uh, Nova and Neutron service in the same node. They will in, usually they will same, they share the same set of dependencies, which means if you want to upgrade just Nova, for example, that's not possible because Neutron will get uh, these dependencies mixed up. So with containers, because all the uh, all the uh, dependencies are separated, you can upgrade just Nova, validate if it's working, then upgrade Neutron, validate if it's working, and and so on and so forth. That makes, uh, that makes automation of upgrades uh, much easier, if not possible at all, because without that, it's, it's asking for problems. It's also fast. And by fast, I mean you will, you'll, you'll see if you try it. Uh, we deployed, uh, we, have a test, uh, we have data from our deployment on OSIC cluster. Uh, you may have heard of OSIC, it's this thousand node cluster which, for community. Uh, we, uh, so uh, around August, we asked for the 130 nodes. It took us 20 minutes to deploy full OpenStack on this 130 nodes. Ceph, pro, uh, HA, everything you, you want on production OpenStack. So yeah, and speed of deployment actually matters uh, because 
imagine this. If your deployment will take three hours normally, and then you just start it and go do something else, and after two hours, 15 minutes, it breaks because you make some instant configuration, so you make this small adjustment to config, you try again, it's six hours past. If you manage to get to the end of the deployment immediately, so apparently after this means that deployments, even though maybe the actual process may take a couple hours, it will grow up, it will add up to, to days or weeks even. If it's 20 minutes, you can just sit and watch it going, and before you go, before you finish your coffee, it will be done, or you will you'll know that you make your misconfiguration, it will be done after hour. So yeah, that's actually important thing to have. So Cola is a product, is a, um, OpenStack project, which, is me, which means to, product, uh, to give everyone Docker files with OpenStack in it. And that means you can build your own containers. You can download our containers, pre-built containers from Docker Hub. We have, we have the Cola uh, account in Docker Hub. And uh, containers comes with a couple of different variants. So it's Ubuntu, there is, uh, there is CentOS, there's Oracle Linux, there's RHEL even, there's RDO. So, Pretty much there are a couple variants you can choose from. And, or you can build them yourself from our Cola repository. And uh, then you also can, we have we added new feature in Newton which allows you to customize pretty much almost everything in container, version of packages, repositories, keys, everything. So yeah, but uh, containers are useless unless we deploy them. And that's when things, where things comes tr uh, becomes tricky because uh, it's nice to build them, but we need to deploy them. We need to configure the container in, the cor in a correct way. We need to generate the configuration file for Nova service. We need to know how to, how to actually do dock and run, what, what directories we need to bind, so on and so forth. So in Cola, we call them orchestration tools. And uh, we have a couple, we have few already. Ironically, we start from Kubernetes, back in Kilo. Uh, initially, Kola was meant to be Kubernetes from day one. However, back in the day, Kubernetes was not exactly the most stable of solutions. It also lacked a couple of uh, critical features we need, namely privileged containers or net equals host. So we need to drop this one. Next one was Compose. Docker Compose is this nifty little thing when you specify how you, run, how you want to run Docker container with a YAML. However, there's no something like, there's no easy way to orchestrate, you know, this container has to run after this container is finished. There's nothing like it. And it's pretty bad in terms of, it requires you to, you, to pass every variable to uh, via environment variable. And Nova has over a hundred uh, configuration options, which means if you would like to create like full, fully uh, customizable Nova, we need to support hundreds of uh, environmental variables and we need to keep up with them because default changes in, call in Nova, we need to change default in our project. The uh, Nova adds or removes one, we need to do the same. It's impossible to maintain. So Compose goes bye-bye. Next one was Ansible. And that one worked. That's the first real orchestration tool, and currently it's production ready. It's there. We started Ansible in Liberty, and uh, Liberty was for us first release. Mitaka was pretty, was already pretty good, and Newton, well, try it for yourself. I, I, if I were production OpenStack, I would run OpenStack Ansible. So op Ansible is done there, but hey, why bother if we already have one, so. Well, so what if we could make the whole OpenStack experience even better? Like, if you've ever actually operated an OpenStack cluster, if you lose, say, a database node in the middle of the night, someone's gonna wake me up, I'm gonna have to like push a bunch of configuration files, find a replacement server, run a bunch of processes, and finally, you know, get back to the original state, so that's not, there's some automation for this, but it's still a lot of trouble to set up. And furthermore, I'm wasting a lot of resources with a standard OpenStack control plane because I'm dedicating like nodes to running Horizon or I have like very fixed capacity for the services like Horizon. I don't really need that. 
So we returned to Kubernetes, and at this point in time, I feel like the Kubernetes community has the same feeling that OpenStack did like a couple of years ago. There's a huge pile of installers, there's CI tooling, there's documentation, there's utilities, there's a lot of stuff that lives on top of Kubernetes, there's an infrastructure being built around it. And people are using Kubernetes right now to deploy increasingly complex and sophisticated microservice apps. Well, so the secret is OpenStack started out as kind of this giant single blob. But over time, it's pretty much turning into this big microservice model. And Kubernetes is going to be the way that you can make this a lot less painful, a lot friendlier. So what does Kubernetes give us? Why is this an advantage? Well, first big thing I'd like to highlight is that Kubernetes allows you to set up autoscale. So there's a bunch of services inside of an OpenStack cluster today without any code changes that are perfectly happy to be scaled up and down, new nodes get, be, get added, old nodes get replaced. Horizon, for example, but not just Horizon. API servers. So what I can do, oops, oh, what I can do is I can set up, like, say, one Horizon node, because it's in the middle of the night, probably no one's touching my cluster, but then as I start to like, get more load, I can add more Horizon nodes. And you can set this up so that it's actually scaling on the right metric, meaning like request latency or observed load, instead of just something like CPU. Furthermore, I can basically, if I really need a whole lot of people are, are hammering on my Horizon, if I really need that capacity, I can use all my spare capacity in the cluster. And I'll note here that like, you might have two Horizon clusters on the same node. That's OK because Kubernetes has a bunch of tooling that makes it really easy to just treat these as blocks to have them come and go instead of like, maybe it's a little easier for me to scale vertically, make larger nodes, whatever. So let's talk about deployments in Kubernetes. This is actually really powerful because the Kubernetes developers realized that there's usually like a couple of different ways that you want to run your apps depending on what it, how it actually works. You know, Kubernetes, it's easy to, to uh, just show someone a, uh, webhead demo that doesn't have any properties to it, but this is OpenStack, it's complicated. So I drew kind of both of the popular ways to deploy something. First, you can have a deployment where you just say, here's, I want like about three servers in this version, and then whenever you upgrade the version, it will wind down in a controlled fashion the pool at the old version and wind up a pool in the new version. And you can auto scale these, you can add them, you can delete them as necessary. You can also create inside of Kubernetes, they added this in a fairly recent release, you can add pet sets. And a pet set is for something like you know, schedulers or you know, uh, uh, RabbitMQ, where it's like you don't want to repartition your RabbitMQ all day. You want to say, I've got three RabbitMQs and that's it. So the way that pet sets work is you, you define, here's my slots, it keeps track of those slots, and then any time a slot disappears and it gets rescheduled, it will go back in exactly the same host name with the same storage, et cetera, that it had before. And when it deploys, it's always going to like take one node out of the slot, upgrade it, and then put the, that node back. OK, so inside of Kubernetes, to make all this work, Kubernetes contains its own service registry. The way the service registry inside of Kubernetes works, it creates a DNS alias. So the config file that you would create for Nova just says, I want to talk to this service at this DNS uh, alias. The DNS alias points to a VIP because, frankly, I've rarely seen uh, anyone correctly implement, like, you know, round robin DNS, et cetera. Like, you need a VIP in front of it. And so Horizon doesn't really know what it's talking to. It'll just hit one of the Nova API nodes. It'll do its work. The same logic, it's not just REST web services that you can use this Kubernetes service registry for. Even if it's like a MariaDB connection where it stays open for a while, that's still a support in the Kubernetes network model. Pretty much, you know, all the ways you're going to talk between one process and another, Kubernetes pretty much makes work pretty easily. Kubernetes does storage management. This is fairly important. So let's say I've got a cluster here, and it's got some spare capacity, but I've got some, you know, say MariaDB or some other services that have disk. Okay, what happens if one of those nodes disappears? Well, as long as you have Ceph or another sort of distributed storage cluster, Kubernetes will realize within you know, a configurable timeout that one of those nodes went away and it has some containers it needs to reschedule. So what's going to happen is 
it's going to move, it's going to create a new container for each of those processes on the host with excess capacity, and then it's going to map the storage back in. So it's as if nothing ever went wrong. You can uh, move them around e very easily. Okay, so what about my existing tools? A lot of people in the OpenStack world have already expended a bunch of time trying to get to the point where they could deliver an HA cluster of OpenStack. Well, the biggest advantage here is that you have, you, it unifies a lot of your tooling. Instead of thinking about, this is the way that this service scales, this is the way this service has heartbeats, you know, keep alive D, et cetera, this is how this service gets uh, dis dispatched to, like HA proxy or service registry, pretty much you have one set of tooling, it's built into Kubernetes, it's really good, and it's being developed by a large open source community. And why bother with, you know, Cola? Why didn't we start from scratch? Well, it's because a lot of our services, it was pretty much all we had to do was take the existing Cola containers, tweak a few things so they'd work in the Kubernetes environment, and we were done. It wasn't like we were reinventing the world to make Cola Kubernetes work. So now I'm going to have Sergey, who is the person who finally got, like, the final piece um, of Nova and Neutron and everything working, uh, and he's going to give a live demo of Cola Kubernetes. Right. <clears throat> yeah, thank you, Kim. Um, for the demo, um, we had a discussion internally and see what could impress you guys. I mean, this is a very highly technical crowd. You've seen it all, tried it all, done it all, and what could impress you? And after some consideration, we decided to, uh, we'll go, we're, we're going to go with the powering of uh, one of the Kubernetes compute node. And uh, to make it even more interesting, uh, that uh, Kubernetes uh, Compute Node will be hosting some essential services, MariaDB being one of them. I mean, probably for people who operate the OpenStack, at least once in their life, professional lifetime, they went through power outage. When server running some database went uh, off the air, and then you had to deal with the uh, recovery, recovering the MariaDB. So <clears throat> we, uh, with this demonstration, we want to show you that your um, uh, sleep efficiency will be increased if you start using the Kubernetes uh, services. <laughs> now, uh, I will need just a few seconds to bring back up my setup and start showing things. Okay. Um, yeah. uh, so uh, how do you... Yeah. Oh, that's kind of small. <laughs> okay, yeah. how do I control it, though? Yeah. Just there. Yeah. Ah, okay, so I have to watch it. Okay, great. All right, uh, so just a couple of words about the test bed. Um, our original plan was to use nukes, and basically to have a, a live demonstration here. But then we thought, uh, talking about nukes on IRC and smuggling nukes from states to Spain and from Spain to back to states could be could be very very uh, serious offense and you can make to FBI watch list right away. So we decided to go with the plain and simple Cisco UCS server. And thanks to uh, uh, Stephen Dake, who is in the audience, for giving us this opportunity to use his hardware. Otherwise, we would be in trouble. Now, so we have five nodes, uh, five uh, UCS boxes running uh, CentOS 7 with the Kubernetes uh, version 143. And on top of that, we are running Cola Kubernetes. And we are using Cola generated images version 3.0.0, basically Newton. So uh, if, you look, uh, if you look at the screen, you will see a bunch of pods. And uh, you definitely recognize some, some of those names. Uh, some of them are not known to you because we, we had to develop them for specific functionality during the development cycle. And I'll, I'll try to mention, uh, yeah, I'll, tr I'll try to mention some of them. Now, so um, let's go. Yeah, if I knew. I would bring a different glass because <laughs> it's kind of hard to see. Okay, control. Okay, all right. So uh, the the way our test bed is, 
test bed is set up, we have an API server or kind of a master Kubernetes uh, server on the control 01. It runs all the API uh, controller manager processes and the scheduler. All four other nodes are basically the compute, Kubernetes compute nodes. You shouldn't mix them up with the OpenStack compute nodes because these are completely two different um, types of uh, animals. So uh, now let me show you. OK. <laughs> Oh, all right, great, thanks. All right, so as you can see, all all of, of all five nodes are up and running with the uh, status ready. Now I need to find a compute Kubernetes compute node which is hosting MariaDB service. Just give me a second. All right, uh, I want to spend just one more second. Uh, when you, when you uh, checked before, you saw some weird uh, um, alphanumeric um, letters added to the pod name. And that kind of shows you that this pod was deployed either with the uh, replication controller or the deployment. But some pods, they have name dash zero and that's the that's how you can tell this pod was uh, deployed using the pet set it's very important it was very important for us to use the pet set because otherwise uh, when you do for example nova service list you you might end up with a bunch of schedulers because every time when the control um, when the uh, container or pod restarts new name get generated. So the new name gets registered via RPC with Nova, and then the list was just growing enormously. But going with the pet set uh, solved one of the problem, uh, being naming the problem. Now, so, okay, uh, so the name is MariaDB-0, now CTL, describe port, zero. And then I want to see what's the node. All right, so as, a, uh, as you can see, uh, MariaDB currently is running on the Falker Control 03. Now, um, before I go and power off that node, uh, I'd like to show you basically that uh, we, we do have <laughs> OpenStack running. Unfortunately, I mean, uh, during this cycle, our focus was developing and adding features, uh, adding uh, important components. And we didn't have enough cycles to develop some nice GUI. So everything is done here basically is uh, CLI based. Definitely after in the next cycle, we'll add some nice uh, GUI gizmos uh, to be more attractive. But uh, I mean, I hope most of you guys are developers who is very accustomed to using the CLI. So you'll forgive me for that. Now, so I'll show you open stack. stack. Yeah, so uh, by uh, running this very simple command, basically we're touching a couple of most important components, Keystone and the MariaDB. So we have a proof that our open stack installation is running. Now I need to go, okay, I need to go here for my KVM. We're using the KVM uh, console. Uh, so that should, okay, let me see this one. We can just go, like, yeah. we can just go here and. Yeah, our KVM got disconnected. Let's not connect it here. Let's just do. Uh, oh, no, no, don't do reboot, do power off. Okay, <laughs> <laughs> okay. No, I mean we could definitely do the reboot. It will, uh, it will, it will work. Here. Power off is easier. I mean I don't want to deal with the the node coming back and then interfering with the process of basically uh, migrating, uh, even though we've tested with the power off. No, oh, okay. Now, okay. So that's gone. We go to the pod monitors and uh, we'll watch. So basically, uh, the idea is to wo uh, watch live what's gonna happen with those pods. 
um, Kubernetes employs a keep alive mechanism, uh, which is controlled by the controller manager, and it sends the keep alive to every compute node. Uh, depending on the settings. Uh, to, Im to decrease the uh, failover time, we had to tune down a little bit the keep alive. So right now we have 10 seconds keep alive with the uh, 30 seconds dead timer. So somewhere between now and uh, uh, here, <laughs> this moment, we'll see some activity. As you can see, some ports uh, get into the terminating state. And um, so that's when the uh, basically system detects something went wrong. We need to evacuate those services from a one failed compute node to the new compute node. And then the second stage, st second state is a uh, port initialization. Um, well, currently uh, Kubernetes doesn't have a, a native fencing support. For these purposes, we developed our own port, which runs on top of the on, on top of Kola uh, Kubernetes and uh, checks for the state of every node. And if it detects a node in the not ready state, it goes and it kills all ports which were hosted by the failed node. In this case, we improve the failover time. Still, it's not ideal, but we managed to save quite a few seconds uh, for that. <clears throat> now. Uh, as you can see, some ports are in the container creating, some ports are in the initialization state. And the difference here is because we have some ports which are uh, using persistent storage, like MariaDB, RabbitMQ, Glance, uh, Elasticsearch. They all use the um, back, uh, Ceph backend uh, volumes. And for the Kubernetes, it takes time basically to go and to, to clear that lock which was uh, created for the previous failed node. That's why ports which are not using um, persistent storage, as you can see, they are already in the running state. But uh, ports which were using the Ceph storage, it takes a little bit longer. So hopefully if everything goes as planned, um, uh, Maria, should, Maria should be up as well already. Look, the, the, I think the no Maria DB is still in the container creating. Yeah. Are you sure though? Yeah, 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 yeah. It's like uh, I think it's Kibana. No, or no, no. It's my, it okay, will, yeah. it will. Yeah, it will come up. You're right. Sorry. Yeah. So um, it's running now. Yeah, it's <laughs> running now, uh, but we have to wait. We have to wait a little bit when all ports are b back up. So as soon as all ports are in the running state from the Kubernetes perspective, the failover has happened successfully. Uh, on top of that, we, we, will, yeah, we will need extra time uh, to, for the OpenStack to rebuild the TCP sessions. I mean, definitely uh, the time which uh, took for a failover was uh, more than TCP, normal TCP session would stay up, and uh, most likely those... Uh, a couple of pending ones. Yeah, a couple of pending. Oh, whatever. It's so, I mean, ball. those are... Uh, <laughs> I mean, we could we could definitely check, but the more important, the most important for us was the MariaDB and the RabbitMQ, and they are in the. Uh, why I don't see the whole screen? I mean, it's just too small because. Yep, it's just too small. Oh, okay. It's, um, this is watch, so yeah, I don't think we're gonna see all of this. So. Yeah, just to... Uh, yeah, I just grab for MariaDB. Okay, TV. okay. Yeah, that's fine. Mm. Yeah, let it's me your, do it. It's let, your yeah, keyboard. Yeah, it's my keyboard. <laughs> yeah, exactly. I know that you are a Mac guy, so... You have, I'm on PC. You, you have French keyboard. It's called Etchup here. Well, I, 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 I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I'm from Montreal, and uh, actually, the French... Uh, Keyboard is a mandatory just, by law. Yeah, just do it. <laughs> no, I'm serious. Okay, so MariaDB is running, perfect. And now, um, so let's do a quick check, kubectl, get nodes. So we should see that we still have one node is not ready because we powered it off. And then uh, let's check where uh, the MariaDB is running now. Oops. Oops. 
the script part. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, so now it's running on the control zero two. And the last check we need to do open stock. Open stock. Yeah. <laughs> uh, <laughs> okay. There you go. It takes a little <laughs> bit of time. So, well, thank you. Well, I mean, what you saw is definitely not ideal. And uh, Kubernetes community is aware that there is a lot of place for improvement and there are some initiatives which will definitely reduce this time, if not completely eliminated in the, in the near future. And on our side, with all, we're also trying to optimize as much as possible uh, this. So uh, we strongly believe that the Kubernetes is one of the more, uh, more promising orchestration engine. And uh, so please join us. Yeah. So thank you, Sergey. That was awesome. Thank you. And uh, as Sergey mentioned, Kubernetes needs some improving. Kola Kubernetes also needs some improving, and we cannot do it just uh, just with three of us or for a couple more people currently involved in Kola. So, guys and gals, everyone here, please uh, join us on IRC. You can find us with the, uh, on the Kola OpenStack Kola on Freenode. I am Inko, this is Wirehead, this is Spesberg, and uh, feel free to uh, catch up with us if you'd like to contribute. We are, we are proud by our, with our diversity of corporations. No, there isn't any corporation in our community that has more than 20% of commits and reviews. That means we are safe to commit to. If any company figures out that they don't want to run OpenStack anymore, this is a safe project to be on, and uh, you'll find our community very, very welcoming, very open, and I hope to see you guys there. Thank you. Any questions? Um, uh, could you please come over to the microphone? It's. Does it work? Okay. Yeah. Um, so you were talking about some containers using Ceph. Uh, is there a driver you're using, special driver? Uh, so Kubernetes on its own has in its uh, repository RBD driver. It needs work, to be honest. I mean, there are features like, for example, the fencing pot that uh, Sergey created. We needed to make Ceph working with it pretty much. That, but, so, but there is native Ceph uh, support in Kubernetes. Needs help, but there is one. Yeah. Okay. And the, there are a couple other storage engines too, like Gluster yeah. and uh, iSCSI. iSCSI, NFS, and so on. It's just we chose Ceph because that's the way we're doing things in Cola. Yeah. Okay. And another question regarding MariaDB. Uh, did you use a Galera cluster here? No. Or is it just simple so this, MariaDB this, with the failover? Record? This is single node MariaDB with external storage. Uh, this is so. Running, cont uh, running databases, transactional databases in, uh, in Kubernetes is still open question. So uh, I'm aware of a couple different solutions. We just picked up the one that we have. We run single node MariaDB. It gets killed, it gets migrated. It's not obviously, as you can see, not without our downtime. There is a couple minutes of downtime. However, that's, thanks to that, we don't deal with network partitions with full cluster uh, down so it's like it's our trade of uh, there's no thing, no good way to do it yet they're working on it yeah. uh, i had a two-part question are you guys using kubernetes for scheduling and placing things um, that have a lot of local state like nova compute and l3 agent things along those lines and if you are, how do you handle uh, failover and recovery sort of operations? Uh, we don't. Okay. <laughs> it's uh, it's <laughs> Yeah, it's this kind of services has to land on the. I mean, when a compute node dies, it it dies. It, Kubernetes will not migrate VMs. 
Yeah. Yeah, just yeah. Uh, I want to add uh, for the for this uh, L3 agent and GHCP agent and Meta agent, we are actually using Kubernetes daemon sets. So we basically every compute node automatically gets a set of ports, and this tree or and some others are automatically gets launched when you identify a specific com Kubernetes compute node as a OpenStack compute node. In this case, we don't have to maintain any states. I mean, they're running locally. They have no visibility about others. They don't need. They just deal with the local VMs. Okay, so the, the, the Kubernetes like recovery and uh, you know, no. sort of things don't really apply in these sort of situations. No. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Other questions? Oh, sorry, sorry. Uh, does this open, being able to run OpenStack on things like OpenShift? Because that's a seamless, OpenShift 3 is a seamless sort of So OpenShift, I, I'm not a Red Hatter guy. And probably there are much, more, much better qualified people in this, in this room to talk about it. But as far as I know, OpenShift is a Kubernetes appliance by Red Hat. We're not deploying Kubernetes. We're deploying OpenStack on Kubernetes. Mm. So technically, I'm not sure if it will, but that might work to deploy OpenStack with Kola Kubernetes on top of OpenShift. So, yeah. We, we have done experiments with uh, firing up a Kubernetes cluster in Google Container Engine and running OpenStack <coughs> inside of Google Container Engine instead of just uh, on a physical nodes. Yeah, I would like to know, is there, are there any prerequisites or can I really just take any Kubernetes cluster and deploy it? So, uh, I, As, I mean, yeah. okay. Yeah, on. uh, the only the only prerequisite is uh, to have a persistent storage. I mean, so it has to be there. Ceph cluster or whatever you can, whenever wherever you can create PV and PVC, which is persistent volume and persistent volume claim. And as long as you can provide these two, so that's be. not internal to there's also version because we we're, oh, we're, yeah. Yeah, we're going pretty much bleeding edge Kubernetes. Right. Kubernetes keeps adding features which we need, and we still don't have all the features we need. So we're bleeding edge. So I would say go with the latest. Yeah. That's that's how we do it. Okay, so so all I need is basically deploy one YAML, all in one YAML, and have a running OpenStack. <coughs> Uh, there is so there. I, I, I suggest you to look at our uh, all-in-one guide. We actually have a step-by-step -step guide to how to deploy. Actually, it will be multi-node because it will spawn a couple of virtual machines, and it will spawn, deploy open uh, Kubernetes on these virtual machines, and then it will deploy OpenStack. Uh, uh, I mean, call a Kubernetes on top of them. It's called Hypercube. Guide is in our documentation. Please try it out. Anything else? Oh. Uh, how do you manage complex net net networking setups? If you want to have multiple networks like we do in OpenStack, we have network for API, for storage, for replication, for compute, so for tenants. It's done exactly the same way. I mean, there is no, there is like you create your, oops, you create your networks in OpenStack exactly the same way as you do. But the Kubernetes, it, 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 it runs or it has its own networking which co um, connects the compute nodes. So, so it's like you run on top of the so Kubernetes provided the network. Kubernetes? Yeah. So you don't use host networking? So basically, uh, we the, do. the Neutron services that need host networking run with host okay. networking. But otherwise, like, you don't need to set up a uh, Cola Kubernetes cluster with like double NICs. You can rely on the underlying Kubernetes mm -hmm. network fabric to keep the external traffic and the internal traffic separate. So everything is part of the same network? Uh, like you don't separate it, it, storage from API from... Uh, Inside of the Kubernetes, there is no storage API. Inside, no, I know, that's right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. but in OpenStack, you can do it. Yeah, but yeah, then you're using host networking when you run containers. So, um, so you don't use the overlay network for Kubernetes, right? Cur current, so... I think, what I, so if you, uh, I'm not quite sure if we can set up this in Kola Kubernetes, like the separate networking, uh, separate uh, storage. I mean, you could if you, for example, connect Ceph via, when you specify Ceph, uh, Ceph uh, connection, you specify IP, so when you specify, of mon monitors. So when you specify IP on monitors, you can specify these IPs going over dedicated network. 
So, okay, uh, so you use host networking, and then when you run your container, you just expose the container of the IP of the host. That's so, uh, okay, when you when you when you run container like API, it will have a, it will have just the uh, control control plane IP, right? Like mm -hmm. Keystone API. If you run storage, it will have exposed um, control plane control plane. Uh, API like MariaDB, and it will also have connected uh, connected storage uh, the sub volume using native Kubernetes support for storage volume, and then you can spe and there you can specify which in the networking which you want to, which you would like to use, and from neutron from neutral perspective, neutron runs on nethost with the services that needs to run on nethost, which means however you specify nethost. That's that's what you're gonna run. Uh, what what's on the host? So there's no magic with it there. Okay. Okay. Cool. Thank you. <coughs> um, um, do you does Cola provide uh, whatever bootstrap is necessary? I heard Bifrost was mentioned. So does do you have a bootstrap phase where Bifrost will be set up? Will set up bare metal nodes with Kubernetes on it? So. In Newton, we created, we have Bifrost. We don't have this equivalent for Cola Kubernetes. This is for Cola Ansible. So we have Bifrost and we have playbooks that will install everything on the provisioned servers, like Docker, and all the prerequisites for Cola Ansible. We don't have something, uh, something like that in, Kuberne in Cola Kubernetes. You pretty much need to deploy Kubernetes. So you're, you're, yourself. On the bright note, there are a couple tools out there outside of OpenStack that just deploys Kubernetes, and you can deploy Ceph with Cola Ansible or however you deploy Ceph, and that's, will, and that's all the dependencies you need, pretty much. Okay. I think we're about out of time. Yeah, I think we're running out of time, so. Uh, Hello, is it any possibility to deploy uh, Cola Kubernetes uh, for sh uh, shared keystone and several regions? It, is was, it was not possible with Cola, but oh, maybe it's so possible it is, with It is Kubernetes. possible with Cola because uh, with Cola you can specify, you can, you can override configs. Uh, no, I, 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 I can do it by myself. Um, we, don't, we, don't, we don't have like, you know, single click deployment of regions, but I can, uh, it's possible to deploy multi-region with Cola Ansible. It's just a bit more steps. It's not hard, but it's possible. With Cola Kubernetes, we didn't look at it yet. It's pretty a real project. We started after, after uh, we actually started first commits where after, went after Austin Summit. So this is what we got with a couple people during last release. So we just didn't do it yet. If you'd like to implement it, it's yeah. uh, welcome. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. yeah. All right. Thank you very much. Oh, what? One more thing, uh, we start our design sessions today. If anyone would like to join our community, that would be a great place to be. Thank you.